All right, everyone. So this is the next video in the series where I'll be covering the sociology of nationalism, the academic debate around it. Uh, last time I covered Walker Connor. This time I'll be covering a guy called Adrian Hastings, who was a, a medieval historian. He was a Catholic priest. Um, and he looked at the debate around nationalism, basically, and he was kind of shocked to see uh, what kind of views were being promoted, what the kind of consensus was at the time. He thought it really flew in the face of what he knew about history. Uh, and so he waded in with this uh, book called The Construction of Nationhood, Ethnicity, Religion and Nationalism, uh, which focuses mostly on medieval history, the emergence of uh, nation states, uh, well, the emergence of nations rather and before nation states uh, in medieval history. Um, and he mostly focused on uh, English history, and he thought that England was kind of the prototype of the modern nation state, uh, and he happened to be especially an expert in English history, so he was perfectly equipped to deal with this. Now, I mentioned that he waded into uh, the debate in academia around nationalism and that he was surprised at the kind of uh, consensus that was uh, around at the time. As we touched on in the last video, the different approaches to nationalism, you have modernism, uh, which was the big target of Hastings, uh, which was promoted by people like Ernest Gellner and the Marxist historian Eric Hobsbawm. Uh, they say that nationalism is almost entirely a creation of uh, industrialization, uh, capitalism, modernization. In the case of Hobsbawm, he says that uh, nationalism is really only a phenomenon after the 1780s. Uh, and essentially, the modernists say that the state creates the nation. Uh, the state comes first. Uh, it needs a national identity for some of the demands of modernization. And so uh, from the top down, it creates national identity. Of course, that flies in the face of the primordialists or people who don't have this very modern view of nationalism that would say that the nation pre-exists the state. Modern primordialist would be someone like Azar Gad, who wrote a book simply titled Nations uh, quite recently, an Israeli uh, sociologist, uh, which argues that nations uh, and what can be called nationalism has kind of always been around or has been around as, as long as recorded history has been in some sense. Um, and then you have ethnicists who are kind of a kind of a middle way between primordialists and modernists. Uh, Anthony Smith is the best example, um, and his work on nationalism, he's probably become like the most influential scholar of nationalism. He was a student of Gellner, but he rejected modernism. And basically, you know, ethnicists uh, will somewhat agree with the modernists, and you know, the modern nation state is is a, a new thing, but they focus on the ethnic element and say that you know nations grow out of uh, ethnic roots um, and that you know modernists don't pay sufficient attention to this so it's only half the story to say that the you know the nation is a, a product of uh, a modern ideology of nationalism um, so Hastings would be something of an ethnicist himself but he thinks someone like Anthony Smith the main guy uh, in this school of thought he thinks that he's too modern in his approach um, he thinks he gives too much to the modernists and when he dates the origin of some of these nations and as you'll see the case of uh, somewhere like England uh, he puts it way before any modernist would dare of talking about nationalism so Hastings contribution as I say he was critical of modernism but he wasn't a primordialist either uh, I think he falls closer to the sort of ethnicist view um, but he did think that the origin of modern nations uh, could be traced much further back than the 19th or the 18th century. Um, and he thought specifically in the medieval period, um, you know, the 11th century for England, 14th century for Scotland, uh, for Serbia, uh, that you can say that these are fully developed nations uh, at this time. And he also argued that modern studies of nationalism um, neglect serious discussion of the role of religion. As I say, he's a Catholic priest. And this is another thing he observed in Hobsbawm is he doesn't really discuss religion. He doesn't seem to see it as having a, 
uh, a big role to play in discussions of nationalism and Hastings has a complete opposite thesis, uh, as we'll see. He thinks that religion is absolutely vital to the development of nationalism and actually tells us something about why uh, it developed where it did and why uh, especially developed in, in Western Europe. So this is kind of an extended quote by Hastings, which gets to uh, the root of his sort of central thesis. So I'm going to quote him at length. He says, what has to be asserted counter to modernism is not any kind of primordialism, a claim that every nation existing today and just those nations all existed in embryo a thousand or 1500 years ago, but rather a finely constructed analysis of why some ethnicities do become nations while others do not. The defining origin of the nation, like that of every other great reality of modern Western experience, whether it be the university, the bureaucratic uh, state, or individualism, needs to be located in an age a good deal further back than most modernist historians feel safe to handle, that of the shaping of the medieval society. I will argue that ethnicities naturally turn into nations, or integral elements within nations, at the point when their specific vernacular moves from an oral to written usage, to the extent that it is being regularly employed for the production of a literature and particularly for the translation of the Bible. Once an ethnicity's vernacular becomes a language with an extensive living literature of its own, the Rubicon on the road to nationhood appears to have been crossed. If it fails to pass that point, and most spoken vernaculars do fail that hurdle, then transformation to nationhood is almost certain never to take place. So, here you see, um, again, the core argument of Hastings. You see that he's sort of an ethnicist himself, um, but what he's trying to do is show that uh, many nations existed way before both ethnicists and modernists are comfortable with speaking of nations. And you see the, the central role he's affording to religion uh, and uh, a written vernacular, which, as we'll see, he thinks is absolutely crucial. Now, uh, it's a bit tedious, but you know we have to cover definitions because, again, the problem, as we discussed in the last video, is pretty much every scholar of nationalism, everyone wading into the sociology of nationalism, um, they almost all have their own definition of things like nation and nationalism. Um, so you need to kind of understand where they're coming from, uh, from the outset. So an ethnicity, a group of people with shared cultural identity and spoken language, um, and this is uh, the major distinguishing element in pre-national societies. Then a nation is something that's far more self-conscious a community than an ethnicity. Again, if you remember back to the last video, we said a nation is a self-defining ethnic group. But uh, if you see Hastings' definition, it's not necessarily limited to one ethnic group. Um, you know, a nation can be multi-ethnic. It's a form from one or more ethnicities and normally identified by a literature of its own. Uh, it possesses or claims the right to political identity and autonomy as a people together with the control of a specific territory. So you see that, you know, nation uh, for Hastings is tied to nationalism, the demand for a nation state. Um, and nationalism for him is, there's kind of two nationalisms. There's as a universal, as a theory, a political ideology um, that each nation should have its own state. But in practice, nationalism is a much more uh, particularist thing, and it's generally a uh, single ethnicity concerned about its own destiny and its own uh, pursuit of a nation state. It's not as um, universal uh, an ideology as uh, presented in lecture halls. Um, so that's just kind of his, his basic definitions to start this out. Now, nationhood. Uh, on the topic of nationhood, obviously that's what uh, this book is is about. Uh, he has a less restrictive definition of nation than other theorists, um, because he says that a nation exists when a range of its representatives hold it to exist: clergy, farmers, lawyers, merchants, writers, as well as members of a court or cabinet. The more people of a variety of class and occupation share in such consciousness, the more it exists. Now, this is important because if you remember back the video on Walker Connor said that I disagreed with his late modernism because he, he says something like no um that you should be very cautious about the idea that any uh, nation existed prior to the late 19th century which is very late even for a modernist to say um when nations began existing um and what I said was that his he has too um rigid of a definition that for him uh, for a people to reach 
uh, nationhood status that basically the whole community, the whole ethnic group has to self-define in this way. Um, whereas Aesthenes, I think, is he has a better idea of this, which is he kind of puts it on a continuum uh, and he says, you know, the more people share in that consciousness, the more it exists. But he doesn't think it's fair to say that, um, <clears throat> you know, if the whole intelligentsia and politicians and merchants and so on uh, all identify as part of the nation, which you have a large number of peasants who don't identify with the nation, maybe they have a more parochial identity, um, that then you say, well, that nation doesn't exist at all, that, you, you know, you completely tie nationhood to uh, this consciousness of mass society. He doesn't think that's a fair way to analyze this, and he thinks it leads to some silly conclusions. I think he's correct. Uh, so he believes that many theorists use a definition that restricts nations to modern mass society. Um, as I say, uh, that is Hastings' view, and I think the, the weakest point of his whole analysis. And now, nation and ethnicity, as I say, ethnicity, again, like uh, Anthony Smith, for Hastings is very important. Again, it's something that modernists ignore a lot. So the more an ethnicity has a self-conscious identity, the more likely they are to respond to intrusion from other groups by forming a nation. So this is kind of crucial to understand in his perspective um, is that the nation there's a few things that lead to the formation of a nation and they're hard to pinpoint exactly it's hard to say which is most important but certainly uh, as we'll see a, a written vernacular um, the role of religion but one thing that's really important is the feeling of an outside threat that kind of forces a nation state on a people almost as a necessity uh, of survival but for that to happen in the first place, for them to even conceive of, uh, well, we need a nation state, there has to be a we. And so the more an ethnicity has a, a self-conscious idea of a we, uh, the more likely they are to, uh, you know, make the logical leap of we should have a nation state. So every ethnicity has the potential for nationalism, but some are too small to activate it and are unable to resist incorporation into a larger uh, culture or political system again pretty obvious stuff uh, you can think of plenty of examples i'm sure where you know the uh, smaller ethnic group uh, is just always kind of at the, at the mercy of a, a larger imperial system maybe you can think of some of the, the smaller uh, ethnic groups uh, in china um but yeah hastings agrees with the ethnicists on the starting point of ethnicity and nation formation he says the intrinsic connection between ethnicity, nation, and nationalism is not to be gainsaid. It provides the sole intelligible starting point for a theory of nationalism. So, you know, there he is kind of laying his cards on the table uh, as regards the importance of ethnicity. So against modernism, uh, he says nation formation and nationalism have in themselves almost nothing to do with modernity. Only when modernization was itself already in the air, did they almost accidentally become part of it, particularly from the 18th century when the political and economic success of England made it a model to imitate. But nations could occur in states as unmodern as ancient Ethiopia or Armenia and failed to happen in Renaissance Italy or even Frederick the Great's Prussia. So again, Hastings is completely repudiating uh, the modernist uh, idea of things. Um, which another aspect of it is they say that nationalism, uh, you know, nationalism is a component of modernization and it kind of serves a purpose in accelerating modernization. And he says that there's actually plenty of examples that undermine this as well. He says that, uh, you know, the development of a Scottish national identity in the 14th century, that that didn't, uh, that didn't necessarily lead to modernization um, or you know, advance some economic consequence. So, um, you know, the example of Armenia that goes right back to like the, the third century, um, Ethiopia goes way back. So he doesn't think it's necessarily bound up with modernization, obviously uh, with modernization and with the, the age of nationalism, uh, of course you get, you get more uh, nation formations, um, but it's not, uh, it's not completely tied to it, it's not completely causal. Uh, and obviously the core of the book is laying out examples that show that. Um, but what's kind of unique in Hastings or what he emphasizes more than other theorists is the importance of religion, but specifically the importance of language. 
and the two are very much connected. The production of a stable vernacular through writing produces a proto-nation as its users entrench the language in education, religion, and government. A vernacular challenges a universal language like Latin while it restricts diversity of local oral languages. And the quote from Hastings is that oral languages are proper to ethnicities while uh, widely written vernaculars are proper to nations. Uh, so again, we see the connection here between religion uh, and language and why religion is so important because of course um, you know who is writing these stable vernaculars often it's the clergy and it's in the context of uh, bible translations and um, you know you can think of the protestant reformation um, and the kind of devolution to to smaller states and uh, you know this uh, explosion in the number of religions can't be identified with states um so, so language precedes a lot of this uh and you know if it starts out being used for um religious uh, ceremonies and translations that kind of inevitably uh, translates itself into um other aspects of of state governance education um into civic society and so uh he believes that you know once there is a, a kind of stable vernacular it sort of leads inevitably um, to people going on the road to nation formation. Uh, and as far as how's that, how that process happens, the first stage is the existence of a mass of unstable local ethnicities. And again, to use the example of England, which he's fond of doing, uh, you could look at Britain in the 6th to the 8th century, you've Scots, um, Peats or Pites, <laughs> only seen that word written down Britons you've incoming Angles Saxons Jutes so you know basically you have all of these uh, ethnic groups in Britain and England uh, and this is a pretty typical example of the whole of Europe at the time um, and basically he believes that every nation uh, follows these stages in nation formation and before you have anything like a nation you have this kind of uh, fluid um, mix of local ethnic identities and then what happens is gradually you have the development of uh, one or two literary languages and larger state formations that diminish the complexity and fluidity of the map um, and you could you know you could read Bertrand de Juvenel for a kind of comprehensive analysis of why you get larger states and why power centralizes like this um, and so to look at it in terms of uh, time period, by the 15th century, most of today's main nations of Western Europe can be seen to exist, though not necessarily in a political form. This is Hastings' contention that, yes, uh, the age of nationalism might be the, um, the late 18th, 19th century, um, but the nations that come to exist and the nationalisms that represent them uh, they are very much in existence uh, by the 15th century, um, but it's just less uh, less sort of consciously uh, political. But in terms of national identity, the identities are there. Uh, and this is uh, preceded by the development of a major vernacular language that kind of solidifies that national identity. Now, the next stage is uh, in the late, late 18th century, as I said, and this is where modernists take as their starting point. Like I say, Hobsbawm thinks that uh, it's meaningless to speak of nationalism before the 1780s. Um, but this is really when it becomes sort of explicitly a political, when it becomes an ideology, uh, when you start having the mass proliferation of nationalisms, nation states. Uh, and of course, what's significant is the collapse of the French monarchy um, and the popular spread of nationalism as the source of state legitimacy uh, is. Uh, both the cause of that and the consequence of that. Um, but this idea of popular sovereignty that had been around for a lot longer than the age of nationalism, um, again, right back to scholastic writers, right back to even the 13th century. But really what happens with the age of nationalism, as I said before, is uh, it's the popularization of popular sovereignty. It's the theory of popular sovereignty made popular once it's identified with um, ethnicity. <clears throat> so, uh, next, we move to the modernist critique. And as I said earlier, Hastings believed modernists too often take it for granted. Uh, I didn't touch on this actually. Hastings thought that uh, modernists took a class analysis for granted too much. So as we touched on earlier, he thinks that uh, 
Um, they ignore medieval history too much. They ignore the ethnic basis for nationalism too much. But this is another aspect of it: is the class analysis. This is especially relevant to Hobsbawm. And when he critiques modernists, he's focused mostly on Hobsbawm because he's one of the few modernists who's actually a historian, a Marxist historian. Uh, and so, you know, as a fellow historian, he's kind of the, the focal point of his attacks most of the time. But uh, Hobsbawm inserts this class analysis that Hastings thinks is um, ahistorical and really warps his judgment. For example, Hobsbawm will say something like, well, you know, are we really to believe that uh, peasants in what, you know, whatever time period he's looking at, that these people felt some sort of identification uh, with the lords, um, the people ruling over them, who was so often the, the subject of their ire. And Hastings says, well, <laughs> you know, maybe a lot of uh, working class people um, you know, politicians are, are the subject that there are, or maybe they hate Margaret Thatcher, but uh, there's still there's still an underlying national identity there. And um, he's just not willing to go along with Hobsbawm and just assuming that class analysis, class identity comes before everything else. Uh, he thinks it's actually much more reasonable for us to assume that actually there's a, a, an underlying communal identity that generally comes before class identity. So you see how Hobsbawm's Marxism enters into his analysis in ways that Hastings thinks makes the whole analysis kind of biased and suspect in its conclusions. Um, and modernist class analysis also leaves out the role of the clergy, who more than any group are responsible for fostering national identities uh, in local communities, especially from the 13th century on. So again, you know, it's the, the clergy that are doing translations and therefore are uh, stabilizing uh, a written vernacular, uh, a national language. Um, it's them that are kind of, uh, um, you know, forming stable communities uh, at the local level, but they also have a connection to larger national communities in terms of uh, where they're educated. Um, you know, some of the, the universities that were in bigger, uh, bigger cities uh, of these kind of proto nations at the time. Uh, so he thinks, again, uh, the lack of uh, understanding of, of religion and of the role of the clergy is a, a major um, point against uh, modernism. Um, and religion, as I say, is absolutely central to his analysis uh, in a way that you just don't find in other discussions of nationalism. And he lays out some of the reasons why religion uh, is so central to understand the nationalism and how they intersect in very important ways and kind of the similar structure to them. For example, the contest, the idea of a contested frontier, uh, whenever a people feels threatened in its distinct existence by the advance of a power uh, committed to another religion, the political conflict is likely to have superimposed upon it a series of religious conflicts. Uh, almost crusade so that national identity becomes fused with religious identity. You can think of the Serbian Orthodox Christianity being in conflict with the invading Muslim armies. And so uh, Serbian nationalism is very much tied to this idea of, uh, you know, stopping the outside uh, invasion force of Islam. Um, and again, as I said earlier, that's a very important element of Hastings analysis is that nations uh, often grow out of the feeling of uh, an existential threat, the feeling of um, necessity of creating a nation state in order to protect the group from uh, a powerful outside force. So uh, again, you see how religious conflict um, lends itself to the development of nationalism in that way. And that also lends itself, of course, to the mythologization of these threats to the nation. <clears throat> There's mythology around the, the formation of national identity that is often very sort of religious in character. Uh, in terms of, you know, some of the kind of um, archetypes that you find in, in these myths, like uh, that's grown up around the, the gunpowder plot, uh, the siege of Derry, which is obviously uh, steeped in religious importance for uh, the Protestants and their understanding of that. The Battle of Kosovo, uh, Joan of Arc, uh, you know, in, in, in that case, you have, you know, martyrdom um, and like... A, same with the Battle of Kosovo, like a suggestion of uh, sainthood, um, 
by the the people that kind of sacrificed themselves for a nation in these battles so uh it's very heavily uh you know it's it's replete with religious symbolism and as mentioned the existence of a clergy is is very important as well in terms of the intersection of religion and, and nationalism because in most medieval societies an educated clergy mediated between the rulers and the ruled uh and if early universities were European in character, uh, as they multiplied, they became more national in ethos. Uh, and so there was a kind of top down from the clergy that were being educated in these more national institutions that were then spreading that national identity uh, to the people they were preaching to. And they're also responsible, as mentioned, for translating the Bible and spreading and stabilizing the vernacular among a population, which Hastings believes is the most important factor of all because once again once you have the uh, stable vernacular you're kind of inevitably on a, a certain road to uh, nationalism or proto-nationalism and then there's the bible and the idea of a christian nation um and the bible is you know some people would say that the the old testament is like the finest example of a, a case of primordial nationalism uh, so the Old Testament provides a, a blueprint of what a God-centered nation would look like. And even if you could say there are things that in the New Testament that override that, um, still, you know, even unconsciously, there's, uh, you know, the Old Testament is is about a, a nation or a proto-nation. Uh, and, you know, when you have a culture that's so steeped in uh, Christianity, of course, that's going to have an effect. Uh, and you see it in the development of of nationalism. You see it in the kind of uh, mythology and symbolism and art used, where you get this idea of a new Holy Land or a new Jerusalem uh, that was central to many nationalisms, especially 17th century Russian nationalism. And that's where this uh, this painting, I believe, is from. Um, and you see a lot of this with with early nationalism. It's very, uh, you know, it's heavy with with religious symbolism and the development of state churches also plays a role uh, this is primarily for the orthodox church uh, because you know you don't have that uh, centralized pope figure you have a greek orthodox church a russian orthodox church and this lends itself to the development of a national identity for obvious reasons um, but also protestantism to a lesser extent and then catholicism to a lesser extent again um the total ecclesi uh, ecclesi ecclesiastical autonomy of a national church is one of the strongest and most enduring factors in the encouragement of nationalism that's a quote from hastings and here is a, a longer quote that kind of ties together um hastings argument uh, about the intersection between religion and nationalism he says the aspects considered hitherto can easily coalesce under our final heading a nation's holiness and special destiny once a Christian history has been constructed for a nation from the baptism of a first king and on through great deliverances, a history of a people's frith and divine provenance, once the Bible is meditated upon in one's own language and with all the immediacy this could bring, once one's own church is fully independent of any other and identified in extent with that of the nation, the more it seems easy to go to the final step and claim to be a chosen people, a holy nation with some special divine mission to fulfill. The Old Testament provided the paradigm. Nation after nation applied it to themselves, reinforcing their identity in the process. Now, he does give a, a mention of Islam as well, uh, in contrast with Christianity. Uh, Christianity was much more suited to nationalism because Islam sort of more explicitly lays out what the political model should be. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the big um, multinational uh, multi-ethnic Islamic state. Uh, there's nothing like this in the New Testament, and so it's kind of uh, an open question in terms of, um, you know, does it have to be monarchy? Does it have to be um, empire? Uh, can it be smaller nation states? And also the Muslim attitude to the Quran made translation almost impossible. So the tendency of Islam is to Arabize new cultures. Um, there's not the same level of... Uh, you know, diversity of, of vernaculars and uh, translations of the Quran. Um, and so, you know, 
that lends itself to uh, integration of of uh, smaller cultures and peoples into a larger whole. Now, finally, on the topic of nationalism, the case of Ethiopia, uh, rather on the topic of religion and nationalism, the case of Ethiopia is significant for Hastings. And he thinks that it's one of the earliest examples of a nation, Ethiopia and Armenia. What they both have in common is they're both uh, Christian and they both formed a, a Christian identity. In the case of Ethiopia, it was uh, the Orthodox uh, Christian Ethiopian church. So Ethiopia is a very unique case. You know, it's uh, obviously it's in East Africa, but uh, it's uh, Christian very early on. And it forms a kind of national myth of its origin that's very biblical, very uh, kind of Old Testament in form. Um, and according to Hastings, uh, it has a sense of national identity um, very, very far back. Uh, so it's obviously a very interesting case if this is true, because it's a sign of a nation formation outside of Europe and outside of any influence of the Enlightenment way before any of those ideas. Uh, Hastings believed Ethiopia's national identity was made possible due to its Christianity, which encouraged a vernacular literature and mass participation in the Orthodox Church. So again, Pattern is the same in terms of a vernacular literature being used for rites and liturgy and then being more widely used uh, for state functions and so on, and that lending itself to national consciousness. And he believes that this national consciousness is demonstrated by rebellions that happened against uh, an emperor called Susenyos uh, when he tried to change the Christian identity. So he was... Uh, influenced by Jesuit missionaries and he converted to Catholicism and so he tried to uh, do kind of a, a mass conversion, uh, make a new state religion and there was a series of rebellions um, which Hastings thinks were kind of horizontal in character, you know, it wasn't just uh, two war in elite families or something, he thinks that there was actually a popular sort of consensus against this, a popular appeal of the, the existing um, national identity tied to the orthodox religion, and so he thinks it's a, a very early example of a, a sort of bottom-up um, popular revolt based on national identity. Again, to quote him more extensively, uh, on this topic, he says, here's a state with a continuous history of 1500 years with the literature, including the Bible in its own ancient vernacular, and an extraordinary, extraordinarily strong and enduring sense of its own identity, political, religious, and literary. If there is one people in history to have been shaped in its own self-consciousness by the Bible, it is the Ethiopian, with their extraordinary early medieval myth of origin recorded in the Kebra Nagast, that the Mosaic Ark of the Covenant was carried from Jerusalem to Ethiopia by Menelik, son of Solomon, to constitute their nation as the new Israel. It is a myth which probably goes back at least to the 6th century. In consequence, the whole Hebraic model of land, people, and monarchy, and religion could here be reproduced. There's no reason to think that this was merely the outlook of a small ruling class. It was rather something permeating the Amoric people and a huge number of their monks, clergy, and lay musicians. So I thought this quote was worth putting in in full because, again, you see all of the kind of core elements of the, the Hastings thesis here. This is a much older nation. Uh, it's a national identity that's prominent among the monks, the clergy, musicians, merchants. And it's tied directly to the Old Testament example of the kind of proto-nationalism uh, of the Jews and to the point where it has a, a direct kind of myth of origin um, that is uh, biblical. Uh, so you see all of the elements here, including the development of a vernacular related to religion that led to national identity. And if Hastings is correct, and this is true for Ethiopia, you know, it completely uh, overturns the whole modernist analysis of nationalism, uh, not least because it's it's outside of Europe, it's outside of the influence of uh, Enlightenment ideas or modernization. Uh, Ethiopia is certainly not a, a modernized country at the time that he's talking about. Um, but his focus mostly is on medieval nationalism in Europe specifically, which, as I say, is his real area of expertise is English history. And so England is very much the, the focus, um, more than anywhere else, 
uh, of his study. And he believes that it already has a, a very strong sense of national identity by the 14th century, but actually you can trace it back to where England is already a nation before 1066 even. Now, why England? Why is England uh, the prototypical national state? Well, he thinks the shires were ideally constructed to develop um, the reality and the consciousness of a united country. They were too small to be seriously separatist, yet uh, important enough to focus loyalty in an essentially uh, horizontalist and healthily emulative way. Uh, so, you know, a bit like the vernacular literature, sort of not too big, not too small, uh, just right for a national identity. Um, but a number of other factors contributed to the development of English national identity. This is a, a list that includes the fact that it had a clearly defined territory, um, the politically unifying effect of the ecclesiastical unity, um, again, a common theme, stabilizing of intellectual of an intellectual world through vernacular literature the growth of the economy and an effective royal bureaucracy and the contributions of uh, two people really alfred the great and his sort of political achievements his achievements in in warfare uh and the contribution of uh bead who was a religious writer who wrote the ecclesiastical history of the english people uh, in 730 a.d and he thinks that that had a, a major effect in uh, being one of the first pieces of literature uh, to present a coherent idea of the English nation, <clears throat> which is a term that's used explicitly in that book, the English nation, the English people. Uh, and he thinks that that's quite significant. There was a lot of translations of it uh, and that, you know, this was the early formation of what was the English national identity uh, that was developed. Uh, but never went away and that that was a, a very early uh, imagination of it uh, in 730 AD. Later, the Magna Carta also had a big impact in enshrining a unified sense of national identity. Uh, you know, he talks about this, the way that Magna Carta was read out uh, in local shires as a, a yearly event. Um, uh, that, you know, elements of, of the Magna Carta, the kind of idea of, of popular sovereignty, that it very much uh, lent itself to a sense of national identity, national unity. It was something for the English to be proud of. Um, it covers the Norman Conquest, which some people would say uh, contradicts the idea of uh, England having a, a national identity as, as far back as he says. But he believes that uh, contrary to some readings of history, Norman conquest didn't wipe out the English national identity. And uh, he says, it looks as if by the middle of the 12th century, an English identity was very clearly being reestablished among the country's ruling class. Um, so he says that, you know, again, I don't know a whole lot about the historical debate around this, but he says that this was, uh, this used to be a popular idea that English identity disappeared uh, during the, the Norman occupation, but he says that uh, recent history has uh, turned on, on this idea. And he points to the renaissance of English writing in the 14th century, which paralleled the wider renaissance of national identity at the time. He says, quote, if the English gave the world the model of a nation state, the Normans ensured that it would be an aggressive model and necessarily productive of counter-nationalism among, nationalism among the entities it overran. So this is another important part of his argument is that uh, English national identity lent itself to being expansionist, to eventually having an empire, um, and it led eventually to the exporting of the model of the nation state, because in the case of Scotland uh, and Ireland, um, those countries had to produce uh, a model of a nation state to uh, as they saw it, defend themselves from England, which had kind of the original nation state. So this is kind of the, the pattern of history is the nation state model is so successful uh, at this time that every time it, it comes into contact, uh, conflict with, with other groups that it kind of forces itself on them in a defensive way. The Hundred Years War is also significant uh, in this regard. Uh, and it had a, a major contribution to English nationalism. <clears throat> 
Uh, one of the key things is that the English armies were made up of commoners paid directly by the king, uh, whereas they were fighting more um, sort of professional French armies. And again, it led to this kind of horizontalist uh, sense of national identity. Uh, you could look at Shakespeare's depiction of Agincourt, where he contrasts the common man on the English side, uh, who's pitted against French nobility. And in Shakespeare's plays, uh, you know, this idea of the, the horizontalist nation is, is uh, very important for a sense of Englishness. And a lot of it comes directly from the, the Hundred Years' War and the kind of mythology around that. Uh, he quotes from the Oxford History of England to bolster his point, which says the most lasting and significant consequences of the war should be sought, perhaps, in the sphere of national psychology. The victories were the victories not only of the king and the aristocracy, aristocracy but of the nation. Now, I mentioned Shakespeare, and he's uh, a good example um, that Hastings uses to show that the existence of English nationalism is, is way, way further back than modernists want to say. And all you have to do is just read Shakespeare because it's already visible in, in his plays. The nationalist message of Shakespeare's histories from Richard II to Henry V is anything but obscure. And importantly, as mentioned, uh, his nationalism is horizontalist. And again, this is important to, because modernists may say that, you know, it's a very small, limited uh, number of the elite that have any sense of a, a nation, if there is at all. Um, but Shakespeare's English nationalism is a, a much kind of broader conception of things. Uh, he says nothing is more significant than the contrast employed between French anxiety, lest even in death, uh, this is a quote from Shakespeare, our vulgar drench their peasant limbs in blood of princes, and the comradeship between the English king and his largely plebeian army. So again, the Hundred Years' War uh, leads to this more horizontalist, uh, broader conception of an identity that's not sort of uh, limited by class that includes the commoner. And it seems they're quite proud of this, and it seems that this is very proudly expressed in Shakespeare. Now, when we look at Ireland, we're looking at an example of how this uh, original nation state model, uh, England being the, the prototypical nation state, he starts to look at how this exported itself, which gets to his one of his central theses that uh, nations emerge from ethnicities, but what forces that emergence? First of all, what makes it possible is the vernacular which comes from religion. So you have an ethnicity or you have a group of ethnicities, you have a kind of fluid scenario. Um, and if you look at something like the, the eighth century, you have religion and the move away from Latin gives you a, a bigger language. Uh, that's not so small that it's like a local or uh, spoken uh, language, but it's not so big that it's this big universal um Arabic or Latin or something, uh, it's the right size. And so it starts to create a sense of national identity uh, as it's used through civil society, through government and so on. Um, and that makes possible the development of a nation. But what's really the catalyst and what really forces that is then when you have an outside threat of an invasion um, of another uh, nation uh, with a competing religion. Now, this is very much the case uh, with Scotland and with Ireland. And if you want to talk about the ethnic roots of nations, well, Ireland has this as strong as anyone. And before there's any conception of nationalism uh, in terms of, again, he's using the term nationalism in terms of the demand for a nation state. But way before that, there's already an Irish national identity. And uh, specifically, there's an Irish Christian identity that had a benefit of uh, being grounded in one single figure, St. Patrick. So St. Patrick, obviously, you know, St. Patrick's Day is very much associated with Irishness and Irish identity, national identity. Uh, and this is very much a, a factor of why Ireland develops a, a national identity so early is that it's it's located in one, uh, in terms of its Christian identity, it's located in one figure. And it also benefited from its geographical unity, of course, being an island. And it was small enough that it was uh, easily, you could, you know, reach any part of it if you lived there. Uh, and so it just, you know, it makes sense. You look at the island of Ireland, um, it makes sense that people will have a conception of, of a united Ireland, as they did very on, you know, the, 
the high kings of Ireland and so on. Um, and all of this meant that it attained a sense of cultural unity very early. But again, uh, Hastings' idea of nationalism is tied to the demand for sovereignty for nation states. So there's a sense of national identity very early that disproves the modernists. Um, but still, that doesn't necessarily mean there's a nationalism there. Now, as we'll see, he touches on how the nationalism developed there. So he says language, law, literature, a sense of historic identity, a particular kind of culture sustained by the orders of bards, jurists and monks. That surely is sufficient to show that Wales and Ireland were by the mid 11th century, well past the dividing line between ethnicity and nation, far as they were from achieving or even seeking a nation state. So again, it's important to remember here, you know, an ethnicity is something, an ethnicity is something objective. Uh, nationalism is when people start demanding uh, a nation state, it's an ideology. Um, but we can, even if we say that uh, nationalism for people uh, developed later, say the 18th century, in many cases, the national identity um and the nation itself developed centuries before that which modernists would deny they would say that the the um the national identity is just a creation of the state of the nation state um and ireland england many other examples disprove this in the case of ireland as far back as uh, the 11th century um, you know, similar time frame with England, you know, before 1066, but as far back as the 11th century, there's a clear, um, it's clear that the, you know, the ethnicity has already moved into national identity. Now, of course, you know, you don't have the, the same level of communications we have today. People are much more focused on uh, their sort of local uh, identities uh, and sort of immediate um ties uh, so what's what's the key factor in why this national identity turns into a nationalism well he says if we skip forward to the 1600s there's uh, two nations in ireland uh, of course the, the irish nation the english nation you know the english people there that identify as english but there's only one nationalism which is the english nationalism it's already developed by this time the 1600s now, Irish nationalism, the Irish nation becomes uh, Irish nationalism um, properly in the 17th century. And Hastings thesis is that this is due to an increasing conflict between the old English and the new English. It's the old English, the settlers in Ireland, um, but ones that maintain their Catholic identity that live mostly in the, the pale, what's now Dublin. But they maintained their Catholic identity, and so they came to be in conflict with what he calls the New English, um, the English that were now converted to Protestantism and were increasingly suspect of uh, the sort of Old English, which he calls them Old English. You know, many of these are Normans or uh, Danish or kind of Scandinavians uh, that were in Ireland. But this, what he calls the Old English, uh, these settlers, you know, they've intermarried a lot with the Irish. Um, as I said, there's more of a Catholic identity there. So suddenly there starts being a conflict between the what he calls the Old English and the New English, especially after Ireland was reconquered by Elizabeth and then William of Orange. Uh, the Old English were forced into a closer union with the native Irish due to the shared religion and the shared sense of oppression by you know the larger crown force. Now, this is a, the reason that this is important is because Again, it gets to Hastings' idea that uh, what pushes a national identity into na eventually a nationalism is the sense of an outside threat, and it shows his uh, claim that English, the English nation state, had a way of kind of exporting itself uh, because it was aggressive, because it was uh, outwardly expanding, because it was seen as a threat to places like Scotland and Ireland. And so what happens is the old English transfer the English nation state view of politics into a Celtic nation. Now, again, be clear, the old English uh, here, they're not inventing the sense of Irish identity, right? Irish national identity, he says, clearly exists in the 11th century. Okay, so the Irish nation exists, but what happens is the political model of uh, a nation state um, gets kind of uh, exported by the English through this intermediary of the, the old English uh, 
that are now in an alliance with the, the Irish. And he uses the example of a historian called Geoffrey Keating, uh, who used his continental church training. So again, we see the, the influence of religion here to put together an ordered history of Ireland, creating a sense of historic unity. Now, Geoffrey Keating uh, has been called the Herodotus uh, of Ireland. Uh, he's a 17th century uh, historian. Um, and his, his book, uh, which I think gets translated just as History of Ireland, um, but I think he wrote it as uh, the foundation of knowledge on Ireland uh, in Irish. Um, but it traced the whole history of Ireland um, from the, you know, from the, the creation of the world to the invasion of the, the Normans in the 12th century. Um, and then sort of uh, prehistorical, like uh, sort of oral traditions about the uh, Milesians and so on. Um, but he writes this history and Again, Hastings sees things like this, like with Bede in the case of England, that these written histories are very important in terms of uh, enshrining and solidifying a sense of unity, national unity, and like a, a continuing history. And Keating himself had this old English ancestry. Um, and of course, he was Catholic, obviously, and uh, he... Um, you know, he has that older sort of uh, uh, Catholic identity, but you see him as an example of someone who, you know, old English, but he is more Irish in his identity. But you see how that, uh, you know, that educational background um, allows him uh, to influence Irish nationalism in this way. Um, so the feeling in the 17th century that Protestantism was a threat to national identity helped identify Catholicism with Irish identity. And that just strengthened the sense of difference. Uh, you know, the Catholic versus Protestant thing very much strengthened that sense of, you know, us and them, uh, a separate identity that was in conflict in a way that, you you know, you don't have with, uh, you don't have with, with Wales and England or, or Scotland and England. And so in conclusion, uh, looking at his examples, now I've just focused on Ireland and England here. And again, this is a very, this is very much a short summary. Uh, you know, the he has two chapters in England, they're like 30 pages each. He's a chapter in Ireland. And he also focuses on Scotland. Um, he looks at, you know, Serbia. He looks at the South Slavs generally. And he looks at continental Europe. But for the interests of shortening this and not becoming really repetitive in terms of the, you know, some of this, you go to like Scotland, it'll be a very similar story in terms of the factors that he talks about. Um, and he's kind of laying them out again and again with each nation. But again, the point of it is to show that this nation, this nation, this nation, ample examples uh, existed prior to the age of nationalism when Hobsbawm and Gellner said it all started. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of them, um, but you can read the book. And it is to say that you know, these are typical examples, and he believes that there are plenty of examples at the back of this argument. And it is primarily a, a history book in terms of an analysis of history. Uh, so I'm not going to go through all of them, um, but those are the two, I think, most interesting and uh, most paradigmatic cases is England and Ireland. England as the prototypical nation state, and then Ireland as a a nationalism that is partly in reaction uh, to that first nationalism, which shows how the kind of export of that successful model happens, which shows the role of the vernacular uh, and religion in each one. Having a, 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 a written document that attests to a, a historical unity, and all of this is happening way before the age of nationalism. And he's also providing plenty of examples that show um, that this sense of nationalism was uh, evident to plenty of people, uh, not just Shakespeare, but other, you know, religious writers, other documents that uh, are around at this time that take this national identity for granted. And in conclusion, the combination of vernacular, geographical unity, and feeling of outside threats led to the emergence of nationalism in the British Isles. So there's, again, his sort of key components applies to England, Scotland, and Ireland. Um, 
And in England, as the model of the nation state, forced other nations like Scotland and Ireland to develop nationalism in response. Again, keep in mind, you know, nations can exist before nationalism. Uh, if you're going to go with his terminology. Now, the nation state model was exported by England to the continent eventually due to its success. You know, at one time, uh, there was probably a time when England and Holland were the only nation states in existence, but with the massive success of England as it developed an empire and uh, some of the other successes it had in terms of uh, statecraft and economy um, because of being a nation state, uh, it kind of led to this kind of inevitability that places like France and Germany would uh, also eventually adopt the nation state model, which was just better for modernization. It was better for warfare, it was better for competition. Um, and so, yeah, the success of it meant that it was going to spread. But uh, again, what's important uh, and what Hastings is trying to hash out in all of this is nationalism is not necessarily tied to modernization. Now to finish with a quote from a uh, quote from Hastings, which uh, again kind of summarizes some of the things I've been saying here, um, but this is his central contention. Uh, this is against the modernist school of interpretation. He says, by the 15th century, Europe's nations were almost entirely fixed and recognized to be such, though very few could possibly be said to be also nation states. When the English model was marketed as a conspicuous success towards the end of the 18th century and the old dynastic and local institutions from the Holy Roman Empire to Venice lost their last appeal, the nationalist movements that rose to fill the gap and modernize the political order took out of the cupboard the nations that had actually already been there for centuries. So I think this just shows the importance of, if we look back at Walker Connor, you know, the importance of having an understanding of what's going on here in terms of the intersection of ethnicity, nation, nation state, nationalism. And so Again, the mistake that people make when they conflate state with nationalism, uh, when they don't take into account factors like ethnicity, uh, and they'll make arguments that nationalism is a creation of the state, and that the national identity comes after uh, the creation of a state and a nation state that then imposes that ideology of nationalism as a mass ideology. But no, uh, Hastings shows that uh, in almost all cases, uh, before there's a, a explicit nationalism, before there's a kind of political demand for a nation state, there are national identities that long pre-exist this. And him being an expert in medieval history, his contention is that by the 15th century, really what we see coming to fruition in the, the 18th century, when Hobsbawm says that nationalism begins, you know, the 1780s, that all of the nationalisms that he's talking about that are suddenly kicking off in the uh, 19th century, um, they're not springing up out of nowhere. They are rooted already in pre-existing national identities um, that survived where others didn't for various reasons. But again, the key contention, these national identities already exist in the medieval period. They exist in the 15th century, they exist uh, in the 14th century for Scotland and Serbia. Uh, they exist in the 11th century for England and Ireland. And Hastings believes that this is this just can't be denied if you take an honest look at the history. Uh, and the factors for this are clear. Uh, religion plays a huge role. Um, geographical factors, um, language, of course, all the things that we've touched on. None of those can be uh, isolated. Uh, you can't say it's just one of those things. Um, you know, there are some ethnicities that develop national identities where other do others don't. There's a variety of reasons for that. There's a variety of reasons why England develops this so much earlier than other countries. Uh, and then Ireland, uh, you know, with the, the geographical unity, uh, the religious element and so on. But again, you have to have this uh, more nuanced view that rejects uh, modernism and sees that national identities are not necessarily bound up with modernization, with capitalism, with industrialization, 
economic development. Again, think of the cases of Armenia, Ethiopia. Uh, and so that's that's Hastings' thesis. He's not a primordialist. He does think that uh, you know national identities uh, don't always exist. They don't go way back. Uh, they are development through language from more unstable uh, localist ethnic arrangements. But he totally repudiates modernism, and I think he does a pretty good job of it. Uh, I think. He makes a really strong case uh, that England, Ireland, the other countries he talks about do have a sense of national unity. And really the only way you could reject that, I think, is to just have a kind of ridiculously rigid version of nationalism uh, that some modernists have where it has to be a complete mass phenomenon where everyone uh, in the nation, right down to every peasant and commoner, uh, has a sense of being part of a uh, nation primarily. But I think I think Hastings' way of looking at this, where it's more of a, it's more of a continuum, the nation is something in process, uh, there can be a stronger sense of national identity and then that can weaken and kind of dissipate uh, in the case of um, something like a, maybe a Welsh uh, identity, but then uh, it can come back stronger than ever um as we've seen happen plenty of times uh you know like the the slovenes the, the croats um so again it's not such a rigid idea that the, the modernists have where uh, it's kind of invented and then it exists and uh, uh, that there's there's no sort of uh, levels or uh, nuance to this uh, and i think when you have that more sort of uh, fluid open way of looking at things then, yeah, you can say with Hastings that, that uh, national identity is something much older than uh, the age of nationalism and that there are plenty of examples that we can say conclusively uh, there were nations there um, as far back as the 11th century or even the, the 4th century with somewhere like Armenia. So uh, that's Hastings' argument. Again, he's not a, he's not a full primordialist. Um, but I do intend to cover a, a more primordialist view as well, which I think will be interesting. But this by itself, I think, is is really a he really does a good job in in knocking down uh, the weakness of of the modernist view of things, which is why he's interesting for that reason alone, with his expertise in medieval history, um, and of course for his emphasis on religion, which other theorists don't really have. He kind of has a you know, and being an expert on that, he has some insights that, that other people don't. And you see the, the interesting sort of intersection between Christianity and nationalism, which will interest a lot of people. But that's all for now. Uh, as I say, next, I hope to kind of cover something that's more primordialist and will go even further back than uh, Hastings. And we'll argue that nationalism is something that goes right, right back. Um, but yeah, I think this is a, this is a, an interesting starting point in terms of looking at the, the weaknesses of the, the modernist view of nationalism. So that's all for now. If you enjoyed this, of course, as always, uh, please subscribe, uh, hit the like button, leave a comment, all that helps with the algorithm. And uh, yeah, take care.